Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Lindsay and today I am back with a true crime story. Today I'm going to be sharing with you a very well-known case in France that happened about four years ago that honestly I haven't been able to find on YouTube or anywhere else in English. I, there's obviously a lot of information in French. Um, and I honestly, I wanted to share this case with you because it was, uh, it's been on my list for a while now. And yeah, I'm a little bit late. I was gonna post a video last week, but as I was researching this case, I realized that there was a lot more to it. So this is actually two cases wrapped in one. Um, today is going to be about the disappearance of Maëlys, who was an eight and a half year old girl who went missing in France four years ago. This case was actually huge in France, kind of on par with Estelle Mouzin or even the Madeleine McCann case in the UK. Um, for some reason, I feel like a lot of English speaking people don't really know about her. So I wanted to share this story with you. And before I dive into the story, I do want to give a few warnings. So obviously this does involve the death of a child as well as topics of sexual assault and abusive relationships. Um, so if that's something you are not ready to hear about, then please feel free to click out. And please remember to like and subscribe if you're new here or if you haven't subscribed yet, it means the world to me. So without further ado, let's just get started. Despite my intensive research on this case, I could not figure out how the last name of this family was pronounced because it is not a French last name. I believe it's Portuguese, maybe Brazilian, but the I'll write it here and I believe it is pronounced de Araujo family, but I'm not sure if in France they pronounced it de Araujo. <laughs> I'm not sure um, because I could not find any information about this. So I am so sorry. I hate when people say, oh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. I did try and find information, but every video I found only refers to Maëlys as la petite Maëlys, meaning the little Maëlys, as well as refer to the family in general as Maëlys' family. So I'll only say the last name here once. Um, I do apologize, but this is a family that lived in the Jura, which is a mountainous region in France. It's a beautiful region. And at the time, Maëlys was eight and a half years old with brown eyes and long chestnut hair. Her mother, Jennifer, was a nurse and her father, Joachim, was a plumber. She also had an older sister, Colleen. And overall, it was a very loving family. Um, Maëlys was a very pretty young girl. She was dynamic. She was a little bit shy around people she didn't know, but around the people she did know, she was very playful. She loved animals. She was overall a great kid. On Saturday, August 26th, 2017, the entire family went to a cousin's wedding. So Anne-Laure and Eddie were cousins of the family who were getting married in Pont de Beauvoisin, which is a town in Isère near where the family lived. And about 180 people were invited and all of the guests were close family members or really close friends. So although it does seem like a lot of people, it was quite an intimate wedding and it was mostly just focused around family and close friends. For the wedding reception, they had actually hired a party hall or a wedding venue where they ended up having their dinner. But as you can imagine with 180 guests, there were quite a few children and they had planned ahead for this. They had actually a room adjacent to the party hall that was still part of the same building, but essentially it was a playroom for the kids. They had hired a nanny for the night just to watch over the kids. Kids can get really easily bored at these weddings, but there were so many kids, about like 20 or so kids just playing together and being watched by a nanny. And around 1.30 in the morning, the babysitter was done with her shift and there were about a dozen or so kids left. So before she left, DJ actually makes an announcement to tell the parents whose kids are still present that the babysitter was leaving and that from now on they needed to basically be parents and keep an eye on their kids. But obviously this is a closed venue with family members and close, fam close family friends. So they, the parents didn't feel any need to really watch over their kids like a hawk. They had kids running around and they made sure that nobody was fighting or choking or anything like that. But overall they were quite happy for the kids to just 
play amongst themselves. Around 2.45 a.m., Maylise's grandmother realizes that she can't find her granddaughter. And at first, her family just thinks that she might have fallen asleep in a corner. Maybe she's still in the playroom where the kids used to play. She could literally be anywhere in the venue. And they start looking around, but they can't find her. So they ask the DJ to make an announcement again. And this time the DJ says, Maylise's parents are looking for her. Maylise, if you can hear this, please go back to your parents. If anybody knows where Maylise is, can you please let her parents know? So basically the type of announcement you would hear in a supermarket if a kid lost sight of their parents. But he makes a second and then a third announcement because they still can't find her and he ends up turning off the music before asking everyone in the venue to start looking for Maelis because they cannot find her and at this point, obviously, her family is getting a bit worried. Very quickly, everybody starts looking for her. They even looked outside of the venue, but they automatically ruled out any escape or runaway situation because it was 2.45 in the morning and it was quite dark outside and the venue was closed off first of all and even outside the venue there was a gate that surrounded the place and then beyond that was mostly trees. I'm 29, I still wouldn't venture out into the dark in the trees. So nobody really believed that she had even left the building, to be honest, it seems so unlikely that she would leave the building. But by 3 a.m., the guests realize that she is actually missing and everybody can just feel the stress in the room. All the parents who still have kids present just keep them close and they can just, everyone can feel that something's gone terribly wrong. Shortly after, they file an official missing persons report and police arrive at 3.50 a.m. They start searching the surrounding streets and as soon as it's daylight, they double their efforts and even look through lakes, they look through the woods, they look everywhere they can. Around 100 officers joined the search party, they even had sniffer dogs involved. And the sniffer dogs were actually given a blanket that belonged to Miley so that they could get her scent and hopefully track it. And they did manage to trace it from the venue to a specific spot in the parking lot. And after that, they had absolutely nothing. So it led police to believe that maybe she could have gotten into a car. The first thing police did was to question every single guest. So 180 guests were questioned. But it seemed impossible that any of them could be involved because they're all close family members or close friends. So none of them thought that it could be someone else in the venue. However, they all seemed to point one man out whose behavior was very strange throughout the night. And this man's name is Nordal Le Landais, which even for, it is a very unusual, it's not a French name, it's a very unusual name in France. I believe the origin is Scandinavian. But most of the guests seem to point out the fact that when everyone started searching for Maëlys, he really wasn't that interested. He didn't join the search. If anything, he looked a bit bored, which is not normal behavior when you're helping anyone look for a child, even if it's not your own, even if you have nothing to do with them. And as soon as police arrived, he left. Which again, you know, it is strange behavior, but it does not mean anything at all. At the time, Nordal Le Landais was a 34-year-old ex-army guy who left the army due to psychological issues. And in the army, he used to train canines or sniffer dogs, any police dogs. He didn't stay in the army very long. And after he left, he tried to start his own business handling dogs, but it wasn't a successful business and honestly I'm really not surprised because I found a clip of him trying to train a dog and I don't know that much about dog handling or dog training but that clip was actually really hard to watch because I am pretty sure that is not how you're meant to handle a dog at any point in the dog's life. So I feel so bad for that dog but I'm really not surprised that his business didn't take off. And he ended up doing a couple of odd jobs here and there once his business failed. And it turns out that Nordal actually has a criminal past. He set a snack bar. I'm not sure if that's the same name in English, but you know, like those beachside type of small, I don't know, like it's not a restaurant, but you can just sell sandwiches and paninis and things like that. In French, they're... In France, they're called snack bars. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. But he set one on fire and ended up going to prison for a year. And for context, 
he and two of his friends were trying to break into the snack bar to steal some alcohol. And one of the friends who was responsible for actually breaking the window punched the window and cut himself pretty bad. So there were bloodstains all over the snack bar, and all over the floor. And to get rid of <laughs> evidence or DNA, they decided to just set it on fire and obviously got caught. And as a result, he got a year in prison. After coming out of prison, he did a couple of odd jobs. He occasionally sold drugs. And in 2017, he went back home to live with his parents. And what's very interesting is that his parents' house, where he was staying at the time, is very, very close to the wedding venue. But what was he actually doing at the wedding? He wasn't originally invited, of course, but he knew the groom from middle school. They used to play football together. And when he found out that the groom was getting married, he sent him a text to congratulate him. And the groom said, please, you know, feel free to drop by for aperitif, which is the starters. And he ended up coming back later that night for dessert. So he wasn't originally invited. I'm not going to say he invited himself over, but it was a last minute invitation, mostly friend of a friend type of situation. He wasn't that close to the groom. Quite a few people believe he actually showed up to sell drugs. That was mostly the point of his presence there. And that could explain why he left as soon as police arrived, but his explanation for leaving when police arrived was that he had alcohol poisoning and he was very sick. And he made quite a few people accompany him, escort him to the bathroom where he would pretend to throw up. So I'm not quite sure if that was a really bad excuse because, you know, he knew he could get in trouble if police searched him and they found drugs. I'm not sure if he even had drugs on him at the time. I couldn't find any evidence of that, but it could be a reason why he left as soon as police arrived. My niece's mom, Jennifer, said that she had a very bad feeling about Nordal from the get-go because she saw him speak to Maëlys throughout the night and he would actually show her pictures of his dogs and she really loved animals. So, you know, as any eight and a half year old girl or kid, you know, you're gonna wanna see more pictures, you love animals. And he would just talk about his dogs and she would keep kind of like circling back to her table and throughout the night, some of the guests heard her refer to him as Tonton Nordal. And in French, Tonton is like, like saying auntie but for uncle. It's a word that you would use if you're a child to talk, like it just means uncle, but it's just like a kid's word for uncle. And it would only be reserved for uncles or maybe, maybe like really, really, really close family members or maybe your godfather, you'd call him Tonton and you usually don't really call, like you don't really use that word, you know, if you're an adult. But it's very, very odd that she would use that word for someone she never spoken to before that she met that night. So it is believed that he introduced himself as her uncle to maybe gain trust because it made no sense for her to call him that. By the end of the next day, so August 27th, 2017, the entire country is aware that she has gone missing. And initially she actually wasn't believed to have been kidnapped. So she didn't get the equivalent of an Amber Alert, but the news traveled very, very quickly. So within hours, the entire nation knew she was missing. People were putting up posters, missing posters, trying to get any information about where she could possibly have gone because she just vanished from that wedding venue and nobody saw a thing. While people are out looking for Maëlys, police only seem to have one suspect and that's Nordal Le Landais. And he actually left the party a few times. He left three times and when police confronted him with this fact he told them that he had actually spilled red wine on his shorts at some point and he had to go home to get changed and then he came back. I'm not quite sure what explanation he gave for the other two times but I guess they weren't too concerned about previously in the night since Maëlys didn't officially go missing until 2.45. He asked him quite a few questions obviously but he remains very calm and he seems to have an answer for everything which, you know, he should have if he's innocent. And although he is very calm, police quickly find out that the day after the wedding, he spent two hours at a gas station deep cleaning his car. Police managed to get CCTV of him bringing his car to the gas station. And while washing his car, he would use 
products that had a very strong scent. So products that are known to actually confuse sniffer dogs. And he would know which ones to use because he actually used to train sniffer dogs. And you know, it could be a coincidence. Maybe they're very common cleaning products that you would use on your car. I'm not sure. But he spent most of his time focusing on the passenger door and the boot of the car or the trunk of the car. And the wipes he used to wipe down the car, he put in a little bag and took it away with him. However, when police tried looking for that bag, they could not locate it. And of course, police confront him with the CCTV footage saying, you're spending an awful lot of time cleaning your car and focusing on very specific parts of your car. You know, what's going on here? And he says, well, look, my car is up for sale. I'm trying to sell my car. I want it to be clean and tidy. And when police speak to his family about this, they do confirm that his car was actually already up for sale and he did have a lady messaging him trying to purchase the car. So that is a very valid explanation. Um, obviously, if you want to sell your car, you're going to clean it first. I'm not sure I would ever bother spending two hours cleaning my car, but that's just me. He was definitely the type of person who liked switching cars off. And I'm sure you know people like that. Maybe you're one of them. Um, you know, you get a car, maybe it's a lease or maybe you bought it and you sell it and you get a new one. Um, some people just really like cars. So again, there's an explanation for it. Luckily, police didn't really end it at the questioning. They found out that at 2.46, one minute after my niece's grandmother realizes that she can't find her granddaughter, Nordal activated flight mode on his phone and it stayed off until 3.30 in the morning. And I don't know about you, but like the only time I activate flight mode is when I'm on an actual flight <laughs> or at the cinema, which is never. Definitely, I don't think I've ever used flight mode for any other reason than being on a flight or at the cinema. So between 2.46 and 3.30 in the morning that night, they have no way of checking where he went. They can't use data from his cell phone where it like pings off the towers. And he actually turned it off again at 3.57 and turned it back on again at 7.06. And when he turned it off, it was at the venue. And when it turned back on, it was at his house, which is again, very close to the venue. So that's two times where he deactivates flight mode or he act activates flight mode on his phone, which is so bizarre. And police also noticed that he had some scratch marks on his arms. But when they asked him how those happened, he said, oh, that was just while I was gardening, I fought a you know, raspberry bush. Like he, I don't know if he brushed up against it, um, but his explanation was he was gardening and I don't know if you call them thorns, the thorns from the, rose, uh, from the raspberry bush are the source of the scratch marks on his arms. However, when police spoke to his mother, she said, well, he doesn't really garden ever. Like he doesn't do any gardening. So that was a bit of a contradiction, very bizarre. Um, could be a genuine explanation. However, he never used to do any gardening. So add that to the list of suspicious behavior and explanations. And to top everything off, the Monday following the wedding, he actually canceled his cell phone plan. Police finally get a warrant to search his car and despite his intensive cleaning, they managed to find a trace of DNA that belonged to Maëlys on his car dashboard. And now there's solid evidence that Maëlys was in his car at some point. That doesn't mean anything else, but it just means that at some point Maëlys found her way into his car. And he never mentioned anything about that to the police. But when they brought it up and they had, you know, DNA evidence, he said, oh yeah, yeah, at some point during the night, Maëlys and a young blonde boy came to my car to see if they could see the dogs. He explained to police that he basically made them believe that the dogs were in the car. It was very bizarre in terms of explanation because obviously the kids got there and realized that there were no dogs inside the car but somehow she was sitting or she somehow put her hands on the dashboard at some point, which again, doesn't prove anything, but very, very strange explanation. And Nodal's brother defends him saying that, you know, he's never done anything weird with kids. You know, that's not his behavior. And even if he did tell them like there was a dog in the car, you know, it would take two seconds for the kids to realize that there are no dogs, close the door, that's it. And all it takes is for 
one of the kids to really just touch one part of his car for DNA to be there and it proves nothing, which is true. It really does. I mean, it only proves one thing is that at some point Maedis was in the car. That's it. For a little while, they don't have many leads, but a few months later in October, the neighborhood CCTV shows a car that is the exact same model as Nodal's car, which is an Audi, do you say Audi? An Audi A3. Um, and it drove 800 meters away from the venue at 2.47 a.m. So at 2.45, Maelis goes missing. 2.46, he activates flight mode on his phone. And 2.47, the same car model he has is seen driving 800 meters away from the venue. Inside the car, police can see a, a white silhouette on the passenger seat that seems quite small. However, it is difficult to zoom in and identify who is exactly sitting in the passenger seat, but it's important to know that Maelis was wearing a white dress the night of the wedding. And at 3.24 a.m., the same vehicle is seen driving back, but this time there is no one in the passenger seat. A cousin that attended the wedding spoke to police to say that he actually saw Maelis at 3.15 in the morning. So that was 15 minutes after everyone officially started looking for her, concluding that she was missing. And police did question the entire timeline for a little bit, but the grandmother noticed her missing at 2.45, she's sure of it. And by three o'clock, people were already aware that, you know, they were already looking for her outside, even outside the venue. So it's very, very unlikely that the cousin would have seen Maelis at 3.15 because he would have known to contact the parents because the DJ made so many announcements. So police quickly dismiss what the cousin claims he witnessed at 3.15. And this is why this case took me so long to post because as I was researching the disappearance of Maëlys, I found out that on December 18th, 2017, Nordal Lelandais is in police custody, but this time it's for a different case. And it was for a case that police never thought they would ever solve. On April 11th, 2017, 23-year-old Arthur Noyer went missing in Chambéry. And Arthur was a corporal in the Chasseurs Alpin, which is the elite mountain infantry force of the French army. Basically, they're trained to operate in mountains, like just the intense section of the army, like strong guys who just do like crazy stuff in the mountains. He had spent the night in that club and around 3 a.m. he left. He was actually a few kilometers away from the barracks, but he decided to just walk them. He was gonna make his way back to his bed on his own and he was just gonna walk it, but he actually never made it back and he hasn't been seen since. The next day, his superiors are informed that he did not make it back to the barracks and they automatically assume that he's a deserter. I think that is the procedure. Like, if you didn't make it back, you must be deserting. I believe that is the procedure. Is like the first thing you think is not they're in danger. It's more like they left the army. Shame on them. However, none of his colleagues, friends, army, co-workers believe that to be true because he actually was really, really proud to be part of the Chasseur Alpin. This is not something you can just fall into easily. He really loved what he did. He was, you know, he had a lot of friends there. He had no reason to just not come back or desert, you know? And his family, of course, believed that something actually happened to him. And for months, they searched the area and they could find absolutely nothing. The only information they have is basically from the CCTV from the nightclub. And they can see Arthur leaving the nightclub at three in the morning, kind of staggering. He's very drunk. He's gone to like three bars before. Um, he was definitely having a good night. And the only other piece of evidence they have on the CCTV is an Audi A3 near the spot where Arthur was last seen. Unfortunately, police cannot identify which car it is aside from the model. And it's very likely it has absolutely nothing to do with him, but that is literally the only other piece of information they had from that night. On September 7th, five months after Arthur's disappearance, a human skull is discovered on a hiking trail a few kilometers away from the nightclub. And it took another three months to actually test the DNA from the skull to match it to 
Arthur's DNA. His family was absolutely crushed by the news because they were convinced that they were going to see him again alive and that maybe he just disappeared for a while. Maybe he needed a break. Maybe he was going to come back. And especially for someone who's, you know, an, a trained army man who is like part of an elite troop, you really don't expect anyone of that nature to be a target. You definitely expect someone of that nature to be able to handle any situation. Honestly, even drunk, I feel like he could do a million times more than I could ever do sober. Unfortunately, the skull that was found did match his DNA. His family described him as a really fun guy who had plenty of friends, who loved to party, loved to laugh, loved to dance rock and roll, and overall was part of a very loving family. The reason Nordal was even linked to this case to begin with and put in custody is because Nordal was actually at the nightclub the night Arthur went missing. And police compared Nordal's phone location to Arthur's phone location. And what's important to know is that Nordal actually had two phones on him. He always has two phones on him, which does make me believe that he probably sells drugs because why else would you have two phones on your person? But he concealed one of them from police. So police thought that he only had one. But when they compared Nordal's phone location to Arthur's phone location, they saw that both of them were kind of traveling at speed so they wouldn't be walking and they followed the exact same trajectory. And once police found out about Nordal's second phone, they realized that both of his phones had been turned off, like in completely turned off at 3.30 in the morning and turned back on around 4 a.m. So there's a half hour window where we have no idea where Nordal went. And although it doesn't really prove foul play, Police already have him linked to Maelise's disappearance, so they start thinking that he probably has something to do with Arthur's disappearance as well. And of course, there's the fact that the CCTV from the nightclub captured an Audi A3, which is the exact same car model as Nodal's car. Since this isn't enough to prove anything, police decided to search Nodal's computer for any Google searches around the time Arthur went missing. And a couple of weeks after Arthur went missing, Nordal actually had searched for things like how to get rid of a body and stages of human body decomposition. And it would be suspicious enough if he had lo only looked them up once, but his researches were quite intense and repeated. And as someone who personally works in a funeral home, and you know, would like to be an embalmer, even I'm not stupid enough to Google things like stages of body decomposition, even though I have a very valid reason to do so. If I don't have a reason to do that, given the nature of my work, then you know, why would he be Googling that? I feel like that's incredibly sketchy and I don't see how he could talk his way out of that. But police interrogate him about Arthur and Nordal just straight up denies knowing him. Just like, never heard of him, Arthur who? And they present him with some evidence, you know, mostly the phones being in the same location for a while, going at speed. Maybe he was in a car, maybe they were in a car together. And he's like, oh, Arthur, oh my God, yes, yes. I gave him a lift. Um, I saw him hitchhiking and I dropped him off a little bit further. That's it, like no clue what happened to him after that. And police were not satisfied with that answer. And after a couple of hours of interrogation, Nordal finally admits that he got into a fight with Arthur and Nordal punched him before Arthur fell and died. And he basically, the way he explained it was that they got into a fight, he punched him, but it's the fall that killed Arthur. So it was an accident. However, between the time Arthur went missing and the time Nordal confessed to the fight that resulted in Arthur's death, a whole year had passed. And by then police really question the motive behind the fight, if a fight really happened, if it really, really was an accident. Because the night of Arthur's disappearance, the night they were both at the nightclub, police found that Nordal had been messaging quite a few people looking for a sexual partner that night. And investigators found out that Nordal had sexual relationships with both men and women. Which again, that's not the issue, but it is interesting to know that it's not just women. So police believe that maybe Nordal 
saw uh, Arthur, who was really, really drunk, hitchhiking, and thought that this is a younger man. Remember, Nohdad is like 34 at the time, and Arthur is only 23, and I'm not sure if he had a sexual motive behind that. But either way, Nohdad killed Arthur. Whether it was an accident or not, it doesn't matter at this point, because he still made the decision to put his body in the trunk of his car and drive a dozen miles before dumping the body on the side of the road, which is absolutely disgusting behavior because even if it was an accident, he still made the choice to get rid of the body and instead of just coming forward and, you know, admitting to what he'd done. Now back to Maëlys. Nordal was still denying his involvement with Maëlys' disappearance. He was denying, denying, denying until February 14th, 2018, when investigators found a micro trace of Maëlys' blood under the carpet in the trunk of the car. So a very difficult area to clean. It was below that little carpet. I think you can lift it in the back of the trunk. And now he's faced with very serious and incriminating evidence that he really can't justify. And that's when he finally confessed that he did kill Maëlys but that it was an accident. Haven't you heard that before? He told police that he wanted to show Maëlys his dogs. So back at his house, because obviously he didn't have the dogs with him. But once she got into the car, she started panicking and kicking and screaming. And in that moment, he just wanted her to stop. So he slapped her, but slapped her so hard that he killed her, which is impossible to believe because the autopsy showed that her jaw had been fractured in two places after a violent blow to the face. It doesn't really line up with slapping. He claimed that once he realized that she didn't have a pulse, he left her body in a shed 200 meters from his parents' house before going back there later and moving the body to a remote location. And he actually did take police to the spot where he had buried Maëlys and they found her, which is how they were able to carry out an autopsy. On March 10th, so less than a month later, police look into his internet history and found out that he had a very bad habit of looking up underage pornography. And by underage, I mean under the age of 10. And he had consulted one of those websites the night he killed Maëlys, as well as the following day. This information added a whole new motive to Maëlys' murder, even though we all kind of assumed there was a sexual motive. We, nobody believes that he wanted to show her his dogs and that he couldn't deal with her kicking and screaming in the car, so he slapped her. Um, but that does add weight to, you know, the concept that there was a sexual motive. On March 29th, only a couple of weeks later, he finally confesses to the murder of Arthur Noyer, and as I've stated before, he claimed it was a fight that ended tragically by accident and police don't believe it, but between the Arthur Noyer and the Maëlys case, police believe that he's probably involved in more than those two cases because that's two murders within five months by accident. And the victims are very, very different, um, which is quite concerning because usually I, I would say, you know, I don't know enough to really be, you know, a master at this, but usually serial killers have maybe a type or they have, you know, a specific motive. But these are two very different people. I mean, they're not even the same gender, age, same like same situation. Um, there's a lot of work to do to figure out if he could have been involved in any other case. But for the murder of Arthur Noyer, he got a 20-year sentence with an obligation to serve two-thirds of it, so about 13 years he has to serve, and that's just for the case of Arthur Noyer. On the night of September 24th, 2018, just over a year after Maëlys' disappearance, police attempt to reconstruct the night of the murder, or the night of the disappearance. And they go back to the original wedding venue where Nordal is present as well as judges and police. And as they recreate the scene, Nordal gives them another version of events. And in this version, he admitted that once Maëlys was inside his car, which again, I believe that the reason he managed to get her in his car was because of the dogs. I do believe that that was 
how he got her to get into the car just to go and see his dogs. But once she was in his car, he inflicted multiple blunt force blows to her head before heading home to change his shorts and wash his hands because they were covered in blood. Which would explain why he told police originally that he had to change his shorts because he spilled wine on them. It was actually blood. And although we'll never really truly know what happened that night, this is the version of events that seems to fit the evidence that police have found so far. Maëlys was buried on June 2nd, 2018 at La Tour du Pain, which is a small village in her home county. And Arthur Noyer's parents actually attended the funeral, which is, you know, they just wanted to show support because they had also lost a child to the same man. Maëlys' older sister, who was 12 at the time, said, Maëlys, I came to tell you goodbye before going to heaven. You were the best sister in the world. You loved animals just like I did. Don't worry, I'm looking after your animals. I wanted to tell you I love you, even though we had never told each other that in person before. Which is such a sad statement. The fact that she was 12 and still went up to share those words at a funeral. Like, I, I see I see people stand up at funerals and, you know, do a speech and I don't think I could ever do that. But she was 12 and she still went up there and said some really kind words about her sister. Um, it was quite a private funeral. No press was allowed inside the church. However, they did have TV screens outside of it. Hundreds and hundreds of people came to the funeral. And Jennifer's colleagues, so Jennifer was a nurse, I believe she still is, but at the time her colleagues came together and they each donated a couple of weeks of their paid holidays, which is so kind. And she ended up with a total of about three years paid holidays. So an incredibly kind gesture from her colleagues and she was given basically three years where she could deal with whatever she needed to deal with without having to worry about money. Um, I think that was quite a wholesome thing of them to do. Um, again, I've said it before, but in these cases, in these stories, you try to focus on the little wholesome moments, um, the acts of kindness. And I think her colleagues really, really came through for her. When it comes to Nordal, it actually does get a lot worse. So Nordal's exes have all been interviewed to see if they could give any idea of what kind of person he was to see if he acted any differently in a relationship and every single one of them confirmed that he was a liar, a manipulator, that he was violent. One of them told, one of the exes told police that after the breakup, he would stalk her, follow her in his car. He would just basically follow her everywhere she went and she actually feared for her life. And the very same ex confirmed that she thought he definitely had something to do with Maëlys' disappearance. Police found some pornographic videos online featuring Nordal and some of his exes. And all of his exes actually confessed to police that he would often make them perform sexual acts and or film them without their consent. On July 1st, 2019, one of Nordal's cousins, who was 14 at the time, pressed charges against him for sexual assault when she attended her father's funeral and he was also present. And he tried to hug her, but while hugging her would try and touch different parts of her body without her consent. And when she finally managed to push him off, he threatened to kill her. If you tell anyone, I'm gonna kill you. But she still managed to tell an adult about this and on July 1st, 2019, she officially pressed charges. Now, one of the worst things as well is that he is suspected of having sexually assaulted his six-year-old cousin. Not only that, but also a four-year-old girl who was the daughter of some close family friends. Um, the reason police found out about this is because he had actually filmed the assaults, um, mostly when the girls were sleeping. And when he was confronted with the evidence, um, of the videos that they found on his phone. He basically said that while he was babysitting his cousins, he was heavily drunk and under the influence of drugs. And that at the time he mustn't have realized that what he was doing was wrong and he couldn't tell the difference between like an adult and a child. Like he was just high as a kite, drunk as hell. Um, 
And that was his explanation, which is absolutely... T- like, first of all, if, if you're babysitting and you claim, like, you're drunk and high, just no, first of all, let's talk about that. Second of all, even if you were off your face on drugs, like, why would you film it and keep the videos? It's, like, it's absolutely... Like, I cannot... I'm just gonna stop talking about it right now. I'm just getting heated. But, but that is an entire case in itself. Obviously, police will have to address the fact that he had film the sexual assault of underage girls, not even underage, like under 10. Although Nordal admitted guilt to both murders, even though he said it is an accident, and he even showed police where Malice had been buried, his family doesn't believe he's a murderer or even a serial killer, uh, which again, we don't know that yet. But his brother Sven thinks that he could be covering for someone else. Who? Um, And his stepsister also doesn't understand his behavior because it's so unlike him. And I can understand not wanting to believe that, you know, what you're hearing is true. I can get that, especially for a family member, that maybe you see them differently. Maybe you only see a specific side of them. Um, But even if you remove Maïs and Arthur Noyer, like this man still has full on evidence of like child pornography, including against his own family members. Like how do you even, what mental gymnastics are you doing to justify or defend that? Just in itself, you know, like, oh, I don't understand his behavior. It's an odd behavior. <laughs> like it's just, throw him in the trash. Like, I don't know. I always find it so frustrating when you know, family really defend people like him, you know, to the very end. I I don't understand it. I am fairly sure that if I were in that situation, I would just be like, we don't know him, we don't talk to him anymore. (laughs) He's dead to us. But again, you know, I do understand that it must be hard to come to terms with, but I don't think they're trying to come to terms with it. So that's just my unsolicited opinion on this. In January 2018, the Ariane cell was created, which is composed of seven investigators and it's basically aimed to study any unsolved criminal case in which Nordal Le Landais could be involved. And at first they actually even tried fitting him into the Estelle Mouzan case. If you have been following my channel, if not, you can go back. My first true crime case is Estelle Mouzan. It has been solved. Um, obviously it had nothing to do with Nordal, but at the time still a huge, huge case. One of the biggest cases in France. Um, but because it was unsolved at the time, they still try to see if maybe he could have something to do with it. I'm so sorry, my camera stopped filming. But basically, they're, they're trying to reinvestigate any unsolved case to see if he could have something to do with them. And by February 2019, they announced that they had completed the first phase, which was sorting through 900 unsolved cases that could potentially be linked to Nordal Le Landais. The court date for the Maëlys case is set for February 2022. It was delayed due to COVID. So between the upcoming court date and the cases they have reopened, I might have to do an update video um, next year, depending on what information comes out, but I will keep you posted. I'm gonna have to wrap this up. I'm so sorry, my camera is dying, but I hope to I hope you like this video. Have you even heard of Maëlys and Arthur Noyer? I, I really feel like it's not spoken about enough. Um, but I really wanted to share this with you guys. I hope you like this video. If you did, please leave a like. If you like true crime, please subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Bye.